Uh, If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Exodus. We're in a series talking about navigating this journey we call life in the book of Exodus. We're now into chapter 4 of the book of Exodus, and we're going to look at chapter 4 and chapter 5 this morning. So if you have your Bible app or a Bible, feel free to look that up. I want to start with a question. And uh, we've all got masks on, so I think it's free to talk. Um, What does it take to grow? Personally, professionally, emotionally, physically, intellectually, any realm, in in your opinion, what are the characteristics, what, what, what are the qualities, what are the steps, what does it take to grow? Just shout them out. What, what do we got? I want to. Yes. Failure. Input. Stamina. Absolutely. Encouragement. What else? What else? Okay. Good. What else? Open minded. I missed this one over here. Nourishment. All right, what else? Guidance. What else? Courage, strength, good. Pruning, ooh, that's an interesting one. So true though, isn't it? Yes, yes. Persistence, absolutely. Good one? All of those are absolutely true. Uh, In order to grow, we have to have all of those qualities. Uh, More of those qualities we have, the more able we are to grow. Um, One of the things that a lot of those qualities have in common, if you'll notice, is that in order to exhibit or to um, practice those qualities, it requires one thing in our lives, change, doesn't it? I mean, if we're going to grow in those, uh, we have to change the way we've been doing it in order to get to where we want to go and and do it the way we would want to do it. And so change is a part of each and every one of those qualities. Uh, The more persistence we have, the more persistence we need. The more enrichment, encouragement, knowledge we gain, then the more we need, and the more we grow, and then the more we get more, and, and the more we're able to grow, true? And that's true in any realm of life, whether it's personally uh, relationally, uh, educationally, intellectually, economically, uh, um, any realm of life is going to take change in order to grow. Now, that's tough. Uh, sometimes change can be difficult. Sometimes growth can be a very challenging path. Uh, and on the road to growth and on the track to growth, there are some hurdles that I think we all face And every leader understands this. Every person who's ever tried to grow themselves, uh, you and I need to understand there are hurdles along the way that will become barriers to growth if we don't recognize those hurdles and we don't understand how to overcome those hurdles. In Exodus chapter 4 and chapter 5, I believe God is trying to grow Moses. Moses is trying to go to the next level. Moses is being called on a mission, and God is trying to stretch him to do something that that is kind of outside his ability, outside his thinking process, and outside of his comfort zone. And so in order to do that, Moses is going to have to change. And in Exodus 4, we see Moses doing that. Now, I forgot to set my timer Well, that's a good thing. For me, I get to go two minutes longer now. Hallelujah. Well, I only preach this long, right? What does it take in order to grow? Number one, I want to give you three very practical uh, action steps, if you will. Uh, they're hurdles that we have to overcome, and, and these are the action steps we've got to be aware of. Uh, number one, in order to grow, we must muster the courage to act. We must muster the courage to act. 
Now, that's not always easy. Somebody said courage earlier. It takes courage to grow. And that's true. It takes courage to grow, but it takes courage to act on that idea. It takes courage to act on that conviction. And we see Moses struggling with this. In Exodus chapter 4, I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit, and then we'll come back to verse 1. In Exodus chapter 4, you've got to give Moses some credit. Uh, I can understand why he's a little nervous. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 23, God tells him to go to Pharaoh, go to Egypt, and you say to Pharaoh, let my son go, let my people go, that they may worship me, but you refuse to let them go, so I will kill your firstborn. That's what Moses was to tell Pharaoh. I'm going to kill your firstborn. Oh, sure. Let me go and tell him that. That's what I want to do. That's a good way to win friends and influence people, isn't it? Go tell them you're going to kill their firstborn son. Hello. No wonder he was a bit nervous. And we see that displayed in chapter 4, verse 1. Moses answered and he says, what if... They don't believe me. What if they don't listen to me? What if they say to me, Moses, the Lord did not appear to you. Now, I want you to pause on that verse for just a second. You know, I have to wonder how much verse one is being influenced by Moses's past. You see, in First 10, chapter 4, when God told him to go, we see Moses giving one of his excuses. He says, Lord, pardon me. I've never been eloquent, neither in times past, uh-oh, there it is, the past, or since you've spoken to me. I am slow of speech and tongue. Now, I just wonder... In his growing up years, we're not really sure what it was Moses suffered from. Some commentators conjecture, and it's total conjecture, that perhaps he stuttered. Perhaps he just was slow with getting the words out. He struggled, and it could it be that as he grew up and as he went to school, you know, Jerusalem Elementary, you know, and the kids made fun of him and they bullied him, you know, and perhaps he just learned that kids just don't listen to me. And so I'm just going to quit talking because I can't talk very well and I'm going to quit speaking. And as a result, everybody just overlooked Moses. Perhaps he was the kid, the wallflower that never got heard because he was embarrassed. He didn't want to look stupid. And could it be that those past experiences were hindering him in the present? Lord, what if I go and they won't listen to me? That's been my experience my whole life. Nobody ever listens to me. Nobody ever pays any attention to me. I've never had any leadership. I've never been respected my entire life. Why would I go and say this to Pharaoh? No way. How many of us are hindered in the present because of an experience in our past? You see, it takes courage to grow. It takes courage to break out, to, to, to get out on the limb and to risk the challenge. To act on that conviction. Has God ever given you a conviction? Maybe even recently, have you felt as though God has laid on your heart and given you a conviction and you've been hesitant or reluctant or resistant or afraid to act in courage? This just came to me this morning. I'd forgotten about it. Let me give you an example in my own life. Years ago, I had an associate of mine. He and I came up with, 
I, I have a little book that I carry around. I call Million Dollar Ideas. I do. I have a little notepad, and, and I, I've got several of them. Million Dollar Ideas, and my kids say, Dad, you're always talking about that. Well, years ago, my associate and I were just brainstorming, and we came up with a million dollar idea. Are you ready for this? You want to know what it was? It was the man candle. You know, every candle out there, they're kind of geared towards ladies. You know, they're, they're frilly and fruity and flowery, and they got these beautiful flowery little scents. And he and I were talking about, why don't we develop a candle designed for men? And we started coming up with flavors like oil. Like, 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 like bark, like beef jerky, the beef jerky candle, you know, a man candle. I kid you not, 15 years later, I'm watching an episode of uh, Shark Tank, and these two guys come on the show, and guess what they're displaying? Guess what they're selling? The man candle. Do you know what their number one seller was? The fart candle. My friend and I, that we had that as an idea. I do not know if they are millionaires today, but this I know, I am not. And neither is my friend, and both of us are preaching. Why? Because when we first floated that idea across to our friends and family, we sure got a mixed bag of responses. They thought it was the stupidest idea they'd ever heard. And their opinion outweighed our courage to act. I could probably be a millionaire today. True story. You can ask my wife. She was in on the conversation. She will validate that. Moses was afraid. He lacked the courage. Now, look at Exodus chapter 4, verse 2. I love this verse. And I think this verse, although it's a small verse, and, and, and maybe I'm reading a little more into it, but I don't really think I am. I think this is power-packed with some principles that we need to get a hold of. And it's a very simple verse. Verse 2. It says, the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? Now, what an odd question. What is that in your hand? Why would God ask that question? He's sending Moses to, to, to co combat Pharaoh, and Moses is afraid, and God looks at him and says, Moses, what is that in your hand? And I always love this time of year. I love any time I get to preach on Moses, because I get to get my Moses staff. It was a staff. It was a staff. He was a shepherd. I think his staff looked exactly like this, don't you? This is a Lake of the Ozarks special, by the way. I, I looked in, you, I went to 15 shops before I found this staff. That just screamed to me, Moses staff. Be split apart, you Red Sea. What is that in your hand? Now, why did God ask that? Why do I say that is power-packed with some important principles? I believe what God was saying is, Moses, I got your back. And Moses, I'm God. I don't need you to be the most eloquent guy on the planet. I don't need you to be a silvery-tongued devil to, to get across my word. He says, I want to use you. I want to use what you have, what's in your hand, what you bring to the table, who you are and what you are. I believe God wants to do the same with us. So many times we don't have the courage to act because we look in the mirror and we say, well, we're not smart enough. 
I don't know enough. I'm not skilled enough. I, I don't have the degree to do that. And, and I don't have the experience to do that. All these excuses. And God simply saying to us, what's in your hand? What have I given you? You see, folks, every single one of us is unique. You are a one of a kind. You have been created in Christ Jesus for good works. And we are God's masterpiece, the Bible says. And as the old t-shirt says, God don't make no junk. God is big enough to use you. Whether you're small or tall, trim or slim, or not, it doesn't matter. He wants to use who you are and what you are and the gifts that you bring to the table. And every single one of us has a purpose in God's plan. I firmly believe that with all of my heart. Moses needed to learn that. Number two, in order to grow, you must get your act together. Now, Moses is about to learn this, and he's about to learn this through a very strange event. I've been waiting for that sound effect. Isn't that awesome? I signed up for this cool website, Epidemic Sound. They have about three million sounds on there, so you guys are going to be hearing a lot of sound effects from this pulpit. I cannot let those sounds go to waste. Amen? It's, it's only being good steward. i got to be a good steward, see. Look with me in Exodus chapter 4 and verse 24. A very shocking thing happens. As a matter of fact, it's outrageous. It's contradictory. It's confusing. In chapter 4, verse 24 the Bible says Moses was getting ready to go to Egypt. He, he and his family and the Israelites were, were going to Egypt. They're going to confront Pharaoh. And along the way, they, they came to this lodging place. And notice what the Scripture says. It says, the Lord met Moses, and he was about to kill him. What? 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 I mean, wait a minute. God has spent several chapters preparing him. God has been talking to him. God has given him the power to do miracles. And now they finally get going. He finally gets courageous enough to take a step. And they get part way. And it says at the lodging place, God was about to kill him. What is that about? I mean, talk about a bait and switch. Talk about changing your mind. God, why? What are you doing? And what's going on here? Well, we understand and we get the rest of the story. In verses 25 and 26, his wife, Zipper, well, that's not her name, it's Zipporah, but... Uh, she took a flint knife, and she circumcised her son. And you get a little family interplay there. You can tell she was pretty upset with Moses, pretty upset with God. She thought it was pretty grotesque, and she let Moses know it in no uncertain terms by saying, you are a bridegroom of blood to me. It's kind of interesting about these verses. Talks a lot about Zipporah. Talks a lot about Moses. I want to know how the son felt. Excuse me. Why is that in there? That seems so terribly out of place. But when you think about it, it's not out of place at all. You see, God had commanded his people as a covenant to observe the rite of circumcision. You can find that in the book of Genesis chapter 17. When he spoke to Abraham. That had been a part and a distinction for the Israelites. And Moses marries a Midianite woman. 
She's not an Israelite. She's not a Jewish woman. She, she doesn't abide by, agree with, or, or, or give in to Jewish customs. And, and evidently, this was probably a, a touch point in their marriage. You, you can get in verse 25 and 26. You can read between the lines and see they probably had argued over this. And guess what? She had won. Moses decided not to offend her, but in the process, he had disobeyed God. That's why I say we have to get our act together. See, Moses had some issues to deal with. Moses had no credibility. Moses had no right to go out and tell other people that they need to obey God when he himself was not doing it. If you're going to be a leader... You've got to be willing to be led first. All good leaders understand that principle. You don't just get to be the top dog right off the bat. God wants to hone us and use us and mold us and use the experiences that we go through. And submission is a part of leadership. And and obedience is a part of leadership. What credibility does Moses have to go to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh to obey God? What credibility does he have to go and lead the nation of Israel and say, you need to follow God and you need to obey God when he himself hadn't taken care of his business? To the point that if need be, God was ready to kill him. Does that give us a little bit of a hint about how God views obedience? It's no small thing with God. Moses needed to get that in order. I'm reminded of a father who was somewhat proud and a little bit bragging. He was talking about his sons, and he announced to some people at a party one day, he says, yeah, this is my older son, he's a doctor. And and this is my younger son, he's a pastor. And he was kind of beaming with pride, and he says, one practices and one preaches. In order to be a leader, you've got to do both. You've got to practice what you preach. Leaders do both. Moses was not doing that. He needed to get his act together. You cannot lead where you have not been. I love John Maxwell. I read a lot of his books. And uh, he's got a lot of good ones out there. And he often has people come up to him and they'll say, John, we're looking to hire a new vice president or senior vice president or CEO. We're we're looking for a a really competent leader. Can, Can you recommend someone? And he'll say to them, well, what kind of leader are you? And they're like, no, 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 you don't understand, John. We're We're looking to hire a leader. Don't you mean to ask me like what kind of leader we're looking for? John says, no, that's not what I mean to ask you. He says, I mean to ask you, what kind of leader are you? Because you will attract who and what you are. You don't get what you want, you get what you are. Does that make sense? See, if you want courageous people to be around you, then you need to be courageous. You want smart people to hang around you, then you need to be smart. You want to have compassionate people in your circle of friends, then you need to be compassionate. See, we reap what we sow. And Moses needed to learn that principle. The third action step and the third hurdle that can get us tripped up is failure. Somebody mentioned that earlier. And in order to grow, I believe you must fail forward. Once again, John Maxwell has written a phenomenal book on this called Failing Forward. If you want to learn about failure, and somebody said failure as as a part of growing It absolutely is essential to grow. Somebody said failures are the whetstones of life. They sharpen us up. They make us better. Exodus chapter 5, verse 1. Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and they said, let my people go. I love Pharaoh's response. He says, who is the Lord that I should obey him? Who is this God? He's about to find out. So Pharaoh didn't listen to him. Pharaoh didn't pay attention to him. But God had warned Moses that that would be the case. And then it went from uh, bad to worse, in, insult to injury. Exodus chapter 5, verse 6, Pharaoh gives this order that, that the Israelites are to make bricks with no straw. 
And if you skip down to Exodus chapter 5, verse 21, uh, it says something rather interesting in Exodus chapter 5, verse 21. Uh, the Israelite people, they, they say to Moses, may the Lord look on you and judge you. May the Lord look on you and judge you. He went from hero to zero real quick, didn't he? He went from being the savior to being the scoundrel who's caused trouble in their lives. He had one job to do, one task, and he goes to do it, and he fails. And he fails miserably. Or did he? Did he really fail? I don't think so at all. Do you? Ultimately, did he fail? No. Did he succeed in that moment? Not necessarily. But that was just one step in the journey. And so often, we allow one step, one misstep to slow us and block us as well. Moses did that, and we see that he did that in verse 22 and 23. Moses returned to the Lord, and he said, Lord, why? Why, Lord? Why have you brought trouble on this people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble on the people. You've not rescued your people at all. Why, Lord? Why? 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 Why have you allowed this happen? Why don't you fix it? Why didn't it turn out differently? Why don't you do something? Why are you letting me go through this difficult time? Why don't I have more money? Why don't I have a car that doesn't break down week after week? Why can't my washer run more than a month? Have you ever been there? Why? That's exactly where Moses was. I've got a really good book that I want to recommend. I'm telling you, I deserve royalties. I recommend all these books, and none of these authors yet have paid me a dime. Not a one. QBQ, uh, written by John G. Miller. Very simple book. You can read it in an afternoon. Very simple, but very profound. He talks about how we ask ourselves questions. And when things don't go right, we tend to ask ourselves two questions. He calls them the why questions and the when questions. Why is this happening to me? Why don't I have it easier than other people? Why is it always so hard? Why, why, why? And when? Like, when is this going to get over, and when is it going to get better? When am I going to get more? When is somebody going to help me? When is life... Why and when? And he says, when we ask those questions, they are the wrong questions. Because they leave you stuck in the past. And when you think about it, that's really true, isn't it? Will why and when get you where you need to go, from where you are to where you need to go? No, they just keep you stuck on the past, on the problems. They do not get you to the possibilities and the potential. He says, we need to be asking two other questions. We need to be asking what and how. Instead of why, ask yourself, what can I do to make this better? How can I learn a new skill? How can I get more education? How can I change my attitude? What can I do to be a more positive spirit? How can I find a different job? What can I do to make it better? See how that leads to possibility? See how that leads to potential? Moses was stuck. In why and when. We so often get stuck in why and when. And it leads us nowhere. We need to begin to ask what and how. I have four books. Those are gifts. Whoever wants them, they're yours. Come up after service. Feel free to grab one. I just ask when you do that. This kind of, We have a little tradition here. Uh, when you're done reading it, bring it back. And we'll put it back on the table because I guarantee you there'll be three other people who want that book. So when you're done with it, just bring it back. We'll put it back on the table. And anybody wants to read it, feel free to grab that. 
QBQ, awesome, awesome book. I love what uh, John Maxwell says in his book, Failing Forward. He says, the difference between average people and achieving people is their perception and response to failure. See, Moses' perception was that he had failed. His response was, God, it's your fault. God, I knew this was too much. I told you in the beginning I couldn't do this. That was his perception, and that was his response. And God is still working on growing Moses. One of the things I love about the Bible is it's so relevant, isn't it? Because honestly, I can't get down on Moses because had I been in his shoes, I'm not sure I'd even gone. And sometimes we're afraid to take action because we're afraid to fail. I think sometimes people are even afraid to give their lives to Jesus because they're afraid to admit they don't have it all together. They're afraid to admit they're not perfect. They're afraid to admit that they're a sinner. Folks, the Bible says we're all sinners. There are no perfect people here today. We're all a mess. But God can take that mess. And he can create an incredible message from it. And that's what he wants to do. You know, God told Moses when he asked him what was in his hand. And Moses said, a staff. And God said, throw it on the ground. Now, I won't throw this on the ground because I don't want to hit somebody in the first row. He threw it on the ground, and the staff became a snake. We don't know what kind of snake. We're pretty sure because the Moses movie, it was a cobra. And you know that's theologically correct, of course. But there's an interesting, here again, maybe I'm reading in, but I don't think so. There's an interesting little command in there. You probably read right over it. When he threw the staff down, God said to Moses, reach out and grab it by the tail. Any snake catchers in this room? Any of you ever caught snakes? Anybody as a child or you, you enjoy? You, anybody? Down? What's the proper way to catch a snake? By the head, you grab them around. And you do not grab a snake by the tail. You know why? Because they'll curl back around and get you. Now, maybe God just didn't know his snakes. I don't think so. I think perhaps that was intentional. You see, in order to grab that snake by the tail, that's not the normal way to do it. You've got to have a lot of faith that God's got your back. Reach out. Take it by the tail. Maybe this week, maybe this month, maybe this year, there's something God is calling you to reach out and grab it by the tail. I know it's not safe. I know it's not smart. I know it's not normal. It's called faith. Do it trusting that God has your back. Let me pray for you. Dear God, help us to have more courage. Help us to be more faithful. Father, help us to be like Moses. We see that he was just an imperfect human being. He had his fears and his faults. And yet, Father, you used him. Father, we're just like him. We have our fears. We have our faults. We have our failures, and it's encouraging to see that you used him. You used Peter. You used the apostles, just normal, everyday people. It gives us hope that we can be used too. Father, help us not to falter in fear. Help us to walk by faith. Help us to have the courage to reach out, to grab it by the tail, and to do what you call us to do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us here today uh, on this video. Thank you for checking it out. I do pray uh, that has blessed you and that, and that God has been moving in your life. If you wouldn't mind just taking a few moments to check out the links below, um, it, it'll be our website. It'll be um, a ways to give or, you know, if you need any prayer or anything, um, please feel free to email us at info at moodrivercc.org. And we really do appreciate you joining us. If you wouldn't mind just checking out our other sermons here, here on the page, um, underneath the playlist sermons, uh, really helps out and maybe be a blessing to you as well. But God bless. Hope you have a great rest of your day. And thank you so much for joining.